Toronto Talk Sports and More. It's your guy NWB, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. This is a gentleman who served in the US military uh, as a Green Beret, and then he would take his talents to football, walking on at the University of Texas as a long snapper before joining the Seattle Seahawks. He would then go on to become a motivational speaker and have a very important conversation with another NFL player. More on that soon. But first is our guest, Nate Boyer. Nate, how's it going? Good. How are you guys? I see all the uh, Niners paraphernalia there. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> There's nothing finer than a 49er. How's um, the quarantine life been for you? Say it again? How's, how's life been like with the COVID? You've been keeping up? Oh, uh, you've been yeah, no, it's good. I mean, like I, I'm uh, trying to stay busy. I got, I got a, lot of, uh, a lot of projects in the works and whatnot. Um, you know, it's frustrating having uh, un un being unsure about sports and all that. It's a little tough, you know. Uh, we need them. And I, I know, you know, we're playing baseball, we're playing basketball, and hopefully we're playing football here, uh, at least at the NFL level and some college. Uh, but it's so up in the air. Who knows, you know. Uh, we definitely need them, though. Right. And before, before you got into football, as I said, you were a Green Beret, and that, that is, that's not just a level of um, a service, because we're in Canada, but we respect that. Anyone who is able to put themselves on the front line, mad respect. But you're also a Green Beret, so that's the highest level, one of the highest levels in the U.S. Army. Tell us about that journey and then how you got into football following that. Yeah, you know, in, in, this, in the Special Forces, um, the, the Green Beret motto is De Oppresso Libera, which means to free the oppressed. And that was, that was something that really spoke to me. That was one of the main reasons I ended up uh, not only joining, but wanting to uh, serve in the Special Forces was uh, because of what they stood for. You know, um, I, I spent some time in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Sudan and Chad and um, seeing the amount of oppression that existed there and, you know, people that they basically don't have anything and uh, they still are uh, constantly, uh, you know, attacked and um, uh, they needed somebody to fight for them, essentially, you know. And I just, I wanted to fight for people like that, people that don't have what we have in America as far as the opportunity, um, as far as basic freedoms um, and, and whatnot. Not that everything is perfect in America, it certainly is not. But, uh, you know, it was a, it, it's, di it's very different in places like that. And so that's why I wanted to serve. That's why I signed up. That's why I joined to go fight for those that can't fight for themselves. And, um, and the, yeah, in the special forces, like you, every mission is by, with, and through indigenous people. So if you go to Africa or if you go to Iraq or Afghanistan or, you know, anywhere, Israel, um, you work uh, and train and fight alongside, fight alongside host nationals, and um, you know you 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 help try to empower them to defend themselves at, at one point, and you know do everything you, you can to, um, to 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 train them you know in a way that that they can sort of self sustain and, um, but also you have to be sensitive to cultures and customs and you have to, you know, be willing to. Um, sort of let go of what you're used to and what, you know, your necessary, uh, I guess, specific beliefs and whatnot and understand that, that people from different places just feel differently and think differently. And um, But at the end of the day, we all want the same basic things. So can you tell us about your, your training as a, as a Green Beret and, and how that is or was? Yeah, it's, a, it's about a year and a half to two years long. Uh, it's very physical in nature, but it's also very mental in nature. I mean, the, the, the Q course, uh, which stands for qualification course, um, in the special forces, there's five or six phases. And you, you go through a selection process, which is very individual. And that's, you know, putting a lot of miles on your body, carrying heavy packs through the woods, trying to find uh, uh, points. And then you have a team week um, where you, you have to, like, solve – some pretty complicated problems with a team. Um, everything is, you know, is out in the, in an austere environment with not a lot of sleep and not a lot of food and not a lot of, uh, 
uh, encouragement. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you got to figure it out. And then you go through language training, and then you go through a small unit tactics where you're learning, you know, sort of Vietnam tactics, you know, because if you're going to some of these places that don't have a lot resource wise, um, you've got to sort of fight old school, you know, in a lot of ways. And then, uh, you know, you go through uh, a SEER school, which is like survival, evasion, resistance, escape, kind of a mock POW camp scenario. That's really tough. <laughs> uh, but you learn a lot about yourself. And then uh, you have culmination exercise where, you know, it all, it all kind of comes together and um, it's as if you're on a deployment and you have to link up with, uh, you know, uh, a, a tribe, essentially, like a fictional type tribe. And uh, there may be some major language barriers and cultural barriers, but you got to get past all that, develop trust, uh, and then sort of train them up and uh, go to war with them. So, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, I mean, that's about as in-depth as I can get in a short period of time. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's very challenging. Most people that sign up for it don't make it through. Um, and, you know, they want people that are, that are willing to, to withstand some, some, um, some pain and some, some tough uh, challenges and problem solve under pressure. And, uh, yeah, it's not for everybody, but, you know, when you get through it, it's worth it because your, your time serving the military – um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's well spent, I think, you know, we, 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 uh, we do some pretty incredible things. Thank you for that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so how is the, uh, during like quarantine and COVID, how have you been staying busy? Like how many pushups basically have you done since COVID hit? <laughs> uh, I don't know how many pushups, you know, I am trying to exercise. I've definitely lost weight. Um, not necessarily in a good way. I, I, yeah, you know, I lost muscle mass. Yeah, I wasn't wow. overweighted before, but um, I'm working on some film projects. You know, I, I want to direct a movie coming up. Um, Ooh. You know, it's it's definitely a very low budget movie, but uh, so I've been trying to put that together and, and figure that out. And that's challenging with COVID because yeah. the rules are different, for instance, on a set, uh, you know, the amount of testing that has to happen. And, um, yeah. Every, everything is, you know, complicated and changed and you've got to like be creative in the way that you go about doing anything, I think these days. So, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been focused on that and, uh, uh, yeah, just various other projects. A lot of them have been sort of film and television related though. So, so Nate, can you tell us a little bit more about the film or is it still on the reps? Uh, I mean, it's essentially about, uh, MVP, which stands for merging vets and players. That's a, that's a charity I co-founded with Jay Glazer. We bring together combat vets and former professional athletes and help them find purpose uh, and identity when the uniform comes off. So that, that transition out of sports and out of the military is very similar. Obviously, going to war, playing a game, uh, those are different. You know, we we're not trying to compare combat to, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to, to the gridiron or anything like that. But the, the transition, the locker room um, – the career being over when you're in your twenties or thirties, um, the brotherhood, the, this amount of sacrifice to be elite, all those things are very similar. So it's about a, a former NFL player and a veteran that's, um, that's struggling with his uh, integration back into the civilian world and how they meet each other and kind of help each other through some tough times. Wow. That's one. That's the idea. I want to watch that. <laughs> I want to be in it. <laughs> I want to make it first. Yeah, so do so. I. I'd be like, <laughs> if you need two actors, we're, we're here for you. I'll yeah, work yeah, for that's you. How just, <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> um, so another question for you there, sir. How was the, uh, how'd you get into the Seattle Seahawks? Like, how did this happen? Was there like a tryout that you went to? Did they just see you and they're like, we want this guy. Like, how did this happen? Yeah, I, you know, I, so I played college ball at Texas and I got to play in a senior all-star game after – uh, our last bowl game. And when I played out there, they had a bunch of scouts that were coming to practice every day, sort of evaluating you. So I had four different teams that were interested in me. I knew it was going to be a long shot because I was, you know, I was much older seen as I, I served in the military for 10 years first. I was a much older rookie than typical. I was small for the position. Mm -hmm. um, but I was a good snapper, a good long snapper. And, uh, you know, they, they knew I had a good, 
work ethic and I'd be good for the locker room. So some of the teams were generally, generally, genuinely interested in giving me a, a shot. And then draft day rolled around the last day of the draft and I didn't get drafted, but I got a call from the St. Louis Rams who are now the LA Rams and uh, the Seahawks asking me if I um, would sign with them as a free agent. Mm-hmm. And I chose Seattle because they'd been to back-to-back Super Bowls. Um, I knew if it didn't last very long, that was a a good place to go, uh, you know, as far as um, the the opportunities that may come from that, you know. Uh, I mean, they they were a team full of uh, guys with a chip on their shoulder, but also it sort of built quite a brand, you know, around what they'd done. And and unfortunately for St. Louis, they just weren't very good at the time and no one really cared. (laughs) about the Rams. So uh, that's why I went with the Seahawks and I made the right choice. I think, you know, even though I only got to play in one game, uh, it was a great experience up there. And, you know, I had great coaches and, and uh, teammates and Seattle's a beautiful place. And this was, this was between the months of like May and September. So it was, it was nice and sunny and, nice. and warm and gorgeous. Yeah. That's how you want it. How do you think the Seahawks are going to go this season? They're in the toughest division in football, NFC West. Russell Wilson's at the helm. How do you think they're going to go? Yeah, I mean, every year it's – well, of recently, anyway. It's uh, – the Seahawks are at the top or near the top every single season, you know, fighting for that that, uh, that championship, you know, fighting for that number one position. I mean, pretty much – since Russell Wilson got there, I guess that's maybe 2010 or 2011. Ever since then, every season, I mean, they they got a winning record and they're either in the playoffs or dang close and been to a couple Super Bowls. So they're going to be right there, you know. I mean, he's he's not going to let them uh, not be. Uh, and they've got they've always got a tough defense. It's, it's hard to play up in Seattle. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be, once again, it's going to be the Niners, Rams, and Seahawks that are, you know, kind of a uh, – that is that is kind of crazy that there's – it's sort of a toss-up and all three of those teams could be the best in the NFC and they're all in one division. Yeah, and, and we can't even count out Arizona nowadays because Kyler Murray and the Cliff Kings through offense, they've got some new guys on defense as yeah. well. That's no, that's Simmons, and Campbell, they, they could make – they could be a dark horse as well. Yeah, that's true. I mean, they are yeah. – they're absolutely a solid team as well. And, yeah, now that Kyler's no longer a rookie, it's so hard to say because he's just – he seems so little. <laughs> but he's, you know, he's just so fast. And, uh, you, you know, you see what what someone like uh, Lamar Jackson did in his second year. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. it's sort of a similar – similar uh, – uh, 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 Potential, you know, same type of player, so you never know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just on the Niners, um, how did you meet Colin Kaepernick? You know, in 2016, just like this year, we we're in the middle of an election cycle. And uh, that's when Colin started sitting on the bench in protest of police brutality and, and, and racial inequality, social justice. And, uh, you know, I wasn't really involved in that, those kind of conversations in the past. Um, but what was frustrating to me at the time, and it's still frustrating, is just how divided we are as a country and how everything is becoming very black and white and binary. And it's like, you got to be this way or that way. You can't have, you know, are you, uh, are you open-minded or are you uh, patriotic? Which one? And it's just like, why can't you be both? And uh, so, you know, I was hurt by what he was uh what he initially was doing as far as sitting on the bench, not standing for the anthem, but I was hurt more because, not because I thought he was disrespecting me or the country or whatever, but just that someone felt that strongly that uh, his country um, didn't stand for him, you know, and and freedoms and and justice for all. And, you know, that bothered me. I mean, that's a country I fought for and, and the flag means something pretty special to me. So I wrote this open letter to him just explaining how I felt, why I felt the way I felt. And a lot of that's due to my service and, you know, carrying caskets draped in American flags. And, um, you know, when I hear the anthem, I get emotional. And so 
I sort of explained all this and, and Colin and wrote this open letter and, and it went kind of viral and Colin read it and reached out to me and he wanted to meet. So I met with him in San Diego before the final preseason game that year. And, you know, we sat in the lobby of the team hotel on game day and talked about all of these things. And he asked me at the end of the conversation, do you think there's another way I could demonstrate a protest that's not going to offend people in the military? And I said, no, no matter what you do, some people will be offended. But in my opinion, I think being alongside your teammates is, is important. And, and right now you're sort of isolated, you know, away from them. And I don't know, maybe it's not the best look. Um, and if you're committed to not standing, which it sounds like you are, and I think that taking a knee would be the other, the only other option that kind of makes sense. And he agreed. Uh, so that night he took a knee during the anthem instead. Um, and it was, you know, it was military appreciation night. And they had a flyover and Navy SEALs jumping into the stadium. And there's actually an African-American uh, sailor who sang the national anthem that night. And Colin took a knee and some people in the stands booed, which was pretty frustrating, but I understand why they feel that way. You know, uh, I, I don't think that's the best way to react to that. Um, and, uh, you know, but that's where the kneeling kind of started. And, and obviously it's, it's been pretty prevalent since then. And now it's kind of spread across the globe with a lot of uh, athletes. A lot of sports. I was going to say just in MLS last night, the Columbus crew took a knee. The whole team took a knee for the national anthem. Um, so you and Colin kind of started a, a huge movement and a huge symbol for unjust and injustice at the same time. Do you no. guys still keep in, in contact with each other? Like, do you guys no. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, actually, um, which is all good. You know, we just are sort of on different paths and uh, whatnot. And, you know, he's got a lot going on and a lot of people in his ear, I think. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I mean... And we don't agree on everything. There's certain things he says and does. I just, I'm not on board with, you know. Uh, he had a, mm. like, a, like for instance, a tweet, something he tweeted out on 4th of July this year that was, I just, I, I can't, I, I don't, I disagree, <laughs> you know, about, uh, uh, you know, this idea that, you know, 4th of July celebrates white supremacy. And I just, that, that, that does it to me. And it does not to a lot of people not only that served in the military, but um, I, I understand why he said that and, and where he's sort of coming from. But mm. um, it was like an accusation too, as if, you know, the, the white people living today are responsible for uh, enslaving, you know, Africans uh, 200 and, or for up to 400 years ago, you know? And it's just like, I, I, they, those may even be some of my ancestors, but that doesn't mean it's me. That doesn't mean that's how I feel. Like I don't, you know, I, I uh, but, you know, that's – so that's just one thing. I mean, there's just certain things we just – we're on different wavelengths with, and that's totally fine. I can still respect him and listen to him, and, um, and he can do the same with me. And um, It doesn't have to be this sort of we have to agree on everything or we're enemies mindset that a lot of the country falls into. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so no, I haven't talked to him in, in, in quite some time, but – it's not for any like bad reason, you know. We don't have. There's no ill will. And Nate, um, I know that you haven't spoken to him for a while, but when you look around the world, you see people kneeling in rugby matches in New Zealand, kneeling in Australia in Australian football matches, people are kneeling in soccer matches in Germany, the NBA, MLB people are kneeling there, even in Congress, the members of the Democratic Party were kneeling. Do you feel that Colin would feel vindicated by his decision to kneel four years ago with people now kneeling uh, in, in the uh, message of injustice and fighting for equality and justice? Yeah, yeah, maybe in some ways. I mean, I'm not sure. I think that would be something Colin would have to answer. But, you know, I also think there's a lot of people that are doing it now because it's, 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 uh, it is so much more comfortable to do. <laughs> you know, than it was even four months ago, much less four years ago. Um, you know, with the murder of George Floyd and the reaction from that, it's like there was a groundswell of support for stuff, for, for demonstrations, essentially. And so now, you know, and that's kind of a dangerous place as well. I, I don't want it to become something that people feel obligated to do. I also don't want people to feel obligated to have to, you know, pledge allegiance uh, to something they don't believe in. 
Um, so yeah, I'm a big person that's anti anti obligation. I want people to do things because they want to do them. I want them to actually feel inspired to to do them and be able to understand, explain why they do them and why they care. Um, so yeah, it's a, that's an interesting it's an interesting topic. It's, an interesting, it's, it's much like um, the topic of uh, of Black Lives Matter. You know, for instance, um, as an expression, as uh, sort of a movement and an idea, I, I'm all on board with it. But it's also an organization, and there's certain things in the organization that I'm not sure about. I don't know enough about. I've read what I can through the website and stuff like that. But you know, there's some things I'm just like I I, I don't know if I completely agree or stand with that. Yet, because it's the name of the organization, it's hard to say like what what is Black Lives Matter? Are we talking about the organization? Or are we talking about this movement and this idea mm. of, of like focusing on, um, you know, people with black skin that, uh, you know, haven't had the same type of opportunities necessarily, um, have been, you know, in a sense oppressed, a different type of oppression than, that I experienced in the, in the Darfur, but still, you know, oppressed in some way. Like, is that the focus or are we talking specifically about the organization when we say those words and when we, you know, we paint that in the street or something like that. It's kind of hard to say. It's almost like I, I think of it in terms of like wounded warriors. People talk about wounded warriors a lot in the military, but there's also the Wounded Warrior Project, which is a, a large nonprofit. And um, there's a lot of people in the military community and a lot of people across the, across the United States that don't support the project because there's been some things they don't agree with how they handle uh, the way that they do things. So, when you say wounded warriors, are you talking about wounded warriors project? Or are you talking about just, you know, soldiers and, and, and Marines and, and individuals in the military that went overseas and were wounded? Um, it just becomes, it becomes complicated. And uh, so I, I, I don't know, all that stuff is, it, it's, it's interesting how, how muddy that, that is. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and I think there's just a lot, uh, there's a lot of nuance to it and uh, probably a lot of, a lot more conversations that need to be had to like figure out what that that's all about. And, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> right. I, I guess at the end of the day, what started off as a gesture now needs to become action. Uh, we as a human race yes. now have a responsibility to help those who not help themselves as you have done um, your many uh, tours and your, your work in Darfur and other regions. We, we need to follow that example that you set. Um, so these things we need to work on in our own communities going forward. It, it can't just be talk, it can't just be nice gestures in public. We have to actually do stuff, otherwise it's a bit of a waste of time. Um, just switching gears, Nate, just tell us quickly about hashtag Indivisible. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I host a show for NFL Network during the season, typically, called uh, Indivisible, which um, it's sort of an Anthony Bourdain-style show. Uh, we go around to different NFL cities, and we meet with players and, and fans and community leaders. We talk about issues relevant to the city, but how football brings people together to solve some of those problems. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to do the show this year, if we're going to be able to with everything going on. I, I really hope so. Um, but yeah, it's also this idea, this concept of, uh, you know, I, I just, it's not really a new idea, certainly. Um, I mean, you know, even in the Pledge of Allegiance, we say one nation indivisible, but we feel like a very divided nation right now, I think generally. It, it doesn't feel, uh, we don't feel as indivisible as we've been. Um, and I just want to stand for that. I want to stand for unity and I want to stand for people listening and, and bringing people with different ideas together and even those with the most extreme ideas on, on the far left and far right, there still should be uh, an element of respect uh, between the two. I think we've been in those places before as a nation. Um, it's always obviously somewhere on a spectrum. It's not all in or all out, but right now it feels like we're pretty low functioning when it comes to respect and, and, uh, having conversations with people that we disagree with, having respectful ones, having uh, uh, impactful ones, um, you know, having a, a logical ones. Everybody's, you know, just trying to prove their point and why they're right and why the other side is wrong. And uh, it's a lot of attacking and negativity and, and 
that's not a fun place to live. You know, that's not uh, that's not a uh, an, an, ind an indivisible uh, situation. You know, that we're we're, uh, we're we're not only letting ourselves be divided, we're dividing ourselves. And, and uh, you know, I just uh, I hope we can come out of that, and I, I just try to stay positive as I can. Fantastic, Nate. You've raised a really good point. It's it's not about who, who is right. It's about what is right, and that's what we need to be striving for um, as a community. We really appreciate your time today. Where can our audience find you on social media? Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Um, at Nate Boyer 37. 37 was my college number, so uh, on Twitter and Instagram, it's at Nate Boyer 37. I also have a website, uh, nateboyer.com, if people like to reach out through there. And we look forward to your film coming out. Maybe yeah, you can hook us up with a quick light cameo, but if not, it's all good. We'll, we'll be there to watch it in any case. Uh, for our audience, this has been Toronto Talks Awesome some more with the fantastic Nate Boyer. For Level 6, let's connect. Thank you for watching. Please click the like button and leave us a comment with your feedback. And don't forget to subscribe with notifications to see more engaging and interactive content. Toronto Talk Sports and more for the love of the six. Let's connect.